Wonderful. Let's get started as people are joining us from the waiting room. Um, thank you all for being with us this evening. Uh, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to another of our series of the conversations um, that are being hosted by the Exeter Decolonizing Network, the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, and the European Center for Palestine Studies here at the University of Exeter. My name is Katie Natanel, and I'm a lecturer in Gender Studies at the Institute and a member of both the Exeter Decolonizing Network and the European Center for Palestine Studies. And I'm really pleased to be chairing this event tonight with two fantastic um, friends and comrades who I now invite to introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ruba Salibi, uh, a PhD candidate at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies, University of Exeter. I would like to thank everyone uh, attending. It is my honor to be introducing our speaker, Professor Ilan Pape, who is a professor of history and director of the European Center for Palestine Studies, University of Exeter. He is an expatriate Israeli historian and socialist activist. Professor Pape is one of the new uh, historians rewriting the dominant narratives on Israel's violent creation in 1948. Professor Pape's research contextualizes the history of Palestine into a larger global context of settler colonialism, and it challenges the dominant Israeli narrative. In addition to his work with the European Center for Palestine Studies, he chaired the Emil Thoma Institute for Palestine Studies in Haifa, and is a founding member of the new movement, the One Democratic State Initiative. He's the author of a number of books, including a History of Modern Palestine, the, Eth the Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, the Israel-Palestine Question. As rigorous critics of Zionism, both Professor Pape's and Professor Butler's works protest Israel's ongoing colonization of Palestine. Moreover, both reject the conflation of any critique of Israel with anti-Semitism. In a precarious life, the power of mourning and violence, for example, Professor Butler rightly suggests that, and I quote, the, ad the identification of a speech that is critical of Israel with anti-Semitism seeks to render it unsayable, unquote. The systematic silencing of voices critical of the Israeli colonial state's violence against Palestinians is entangled within a wider context of power relations whereby some lives are rendered griefable while others are not. Similarly, Professor Pape's work on Palestine highlights the settler colonial nature of the Israeli state, one that constantly seeks expansion through the elimination of the Palestinian presence. Both of their scholarship has been essential to exposing the violence committed by the colonial Israeli state against the Palestinian body, history, geography, and identity. Professor Butler and Professor Pape treat Palestine not as an exceptional issue, but one that is connected to a wider global context of capitalist, colonial, gendered, sexual, and racial oppression. We look forward to what promises to be a generative and thought-provoking discussion on humanity, violence, and the imagination. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roba. Um, thank you, Katie. Um, I'm Kwara el I'm a final year Arabic and Islamic studies student at the University of Exeter. I've just muted all, and I'm going to unmute you, Clara. Hang on just a second. You should be able to unmute now, Clara. Yeah, is, is that good? That's good, thank you. Perfect, um, I'll just start from the beginning. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Clara el -Kiki. I'm a final year Arabic and Islamic studies student at the University of Exeter. Um, my, focus, my studies primarily focus on the multiple layers of violence past and present in Lebanon today. Um, and I have the absolute pleasure of introducing our guest of honor, uh, Professor Judith Butler. 
Um, Judith Butler, Maxine Elliott Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of California, Berkeley, is renowned for their work in gender and sexuality, feminist and queer theory, philosophy, literature, and critical theory. They are one of the most influential and innovative thinkers of our time, having developed groundbreaking approaches to power, discourse, and identity. While their scholarship powerfully enriches academia, Butler's work also impacts activism from queer and feminist politics to anti-racism and critiques of Zionism. They are active in several human rights organizations, including the Center for Constitutional Rights in New York and the Advisory Board for the Jewish Voice for Peace. Their best-selling works include Gender Trouble, Feminism and the Subversion of Identity, Bodies That Matter, On the Discursive Limits of Sex, and Precarious Life, The Powers of Mourning and Vi Violence and Mourning. Their most recent book, The Force of Nonviolence, An Ethico-Political Bind, was published by Verso Press in 2020. It was towards the end of last year that I really became familiar with Judith Butler and their work, when Katie so wonderfully introduced me to the book, Precarious Life, um, and I haven't looked back since. I rarely begin a writing, academic or otherwise, without thinking about the topics and points explored in this point in reflection on what grief and loss say about life and what it means to be human. Professor Pape's work on settler colonialism and Professor Butler's exploration of the dynamics of grief and, mourn grief and mourning are a constant presence in my studies, as I question what it takes for life in the Middle East to be recognized as worthy as prosperity, dignity, and freedom from an almost perpetual expectation and experience of violence. I'll be forever indebted to Professors Butler and Pape for inspiring me in this journey. Um, finally, thank you, Katie, and thank you, Professor Elan. Thank you for the whole EDN, IAIS, and ECPS team for making this possible. Special thanks, of course, to our guest of honor, Professor Judith Butler. I'm sure I speak on behalf of many of my peers and colleagues when I say we are so humbled to welcome you here tonight, and we sincere, sincerely look forward to your conversation with Professor Pape. Thank you both for those wonderful, amazing introductions. Um, I'll do just a little bit of housekeeping only for a couple of minutes, and then we will hand straight over to Professors Butler and Pape for the conversation that we have been waiting for. Um, we want to say thank you uh, to a number of people, even though the thanks have been coming in um, so, so beautifully up until now. But thank you to the team behind the event who absolutely must be recognized. There's been a lot of love and a lot of labor that has gone into this. Um, so thank you to Andrea Wallace, um, to Neha Shaji, Asha Ali, Finlay Carroll, Tanashe Verhage, Sarah Wood, Sarah Roberts, Sajad Rizvi, Gareth Stansfield, Toby Squire, Helen Gillespie, Emma Clark, and then all of the Exeter Decolonizing Network student fellows who have just been an amazing um, force of inspiration and action this year at the university. Thank you as well to our global audience. Um, as the person who verifies identities, I know and am just so amazed um, by the fact that we have people joining us from Nigeria to Kashmir to Saudi Arabia to Brazil and Iceland, Luxembourg, Italy, the United States, the UK and beyond. And it's really and truly an honor to share this time with you. Thank you to the co our co-hosts, um, Roba and Clara, who are, as I said, dear friends and comrades. And thank you to professors Butler and Professor Pape as well. <laughs> so in terms of format, um, there will be, after a number of guidelines here, a conversation between Professor Butler and Professor Pape for 45 minutes, taking us until 7 p.m. At that point, then we will have a question and answer session, which will be moderated by myself and Clara and Roba as chairs. And I'll explain how you can participate in just a second. The guidelines that we're asking you to um, observe are first for those of us who are here in the room on Zoom, please keep your microphones muted during the event just to avoid interruption. Your cameras can be on or off as you wish. For comments and questions, which we welcome, um, these are invited through the chat on Zoom if you're with us in the room or through the hashtag ButlerPape2021, which is visible on the title on YouTube. So again, these will be collected um, and then moderated by myself and Roba and Clara um, to end the evening with the, with the question and answer session. We ask when you do submit your comments and questions that you communicate with kindness and respect um, as you would in person. This has been a difficult year um, marked by anxiety and loss and it is still terrifyingly acute for many. So how we speak, how we communicate matters. 
Finally, please note that this event is being recorded. Um, you are welcome, those of you here with us in Zoom, to change your screen name if you wish to remain anonymous once you're with us in the room. Um, during the question and answer, so you know, we will be using names to identify the speaker, the person posing the question. So I'm going to hand over, I promise, in one second um, to, our, to our guests, um, our esteemed colleagues and comrades here tonight. But it does feel important to acknowledge um, the context in which this conversation is taking place. So we are here to witness and take part in a dialogue about violence, humanity and imagination in the wake of a conviction for the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but also as police brutality against people and communities of color is ongoing. And this has recently cost the lives of young people like Adam Toledo in Chicago, Illinois, and Makia Bryant in Columbus, Ohio. And scenes from Jerusalem in the past week remind us again of how racism, violence, and policing articulate together to shore up power. This conversation also takes place as global inequalities are made clear through the distribution of vaccines and access to life-saving technologies, which literally mean the difference between life and death in the midst of a pandemic accounts and for many experiences of desperation and heartbreak in India speak volumes about how health, wealth and privilege intertwine. So it strikes me as a time to be bold in our thoughts and our actions and to invoke the language of abolition and redistributive justice, to be radical and courageous in making these ideas our practice. So we're gathered here today to listen and to learn from professors Butler and Pape, whose work has profoundly changed how we diagnose violence and injustice, as well as how we confront these forces and work toward new futures. So with that, we are very eager to hear from you tonight. I hand the floor to you both. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do I have to unmute? No, I'm, I'm not muted, which is a good experience for me coming back from Israel. Um, uh, these conversations are a work in progress, uh, dear Judith, and are informed by issues that interest diverse collectives in our university, such as the European Center for Palestine Studies, uh, the Institute for Arab and Islamic Studies, the Exeter Decolonizing Network, and other small groups. So our questions would evolve around diverse themes that may seem discrete, but are connected first and foremost by your work and also by the uh, global reality in which we live. They will concern our attitude to life in settler colonial realities, such as the one that prevails in Palestine and one, the one unfolding in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic all over the globe. Other issues include our ability as producers of knowledge in the West to provide insights into non-Western realities in questions of gender and LGBTQ rights, our definition of universalism that to some of us too often seems to equate Westernism, even if voiced by radical and progressive activists and intellectuals. And finally, returning to Palestine, we will ponder on the nonviolent struggle for decolonization in the 21st century. So dear Judith, I hope you will bear with a somewhat erratic mixture of impulses and concerns. All these questions stem directly from what we heard from you through your books, articles, lectures, and interviews over the years. And this incredible read by itself injects a respectable logic that connects all these discrete uh, subjects. My first question is about the way one can, if one can, operationalize in, a daily, in daily life experience uh, your notions on the grievable and ungrievable, not only in the questions of whose life is valuable, but rather in the field of compassion. Much of my effort and that of many of my Palestinian friends who live in Israel is focused on an attempt to engage the Jewish public there and in the world with the human cost of the Palestinian 1948 catastrophe, the Nakba, which we will commemor commemorate uh, on the 15th of May uh, in a short while. The effort here is to persuade them to acknowledge the catastrophe, the Nakba, as a formative event that needs psychological, legal, moral, and of course political closure, and do it by at least showing basic compassion or grief 
towards the suffering of the victims of the Nakba before discussing anything else. When you try and do this, you are immediately faced with a callous wall of rejection informed by a gut mechanism of defense that blocks any compassion. There is no grieving for the victims, for the Palestinian victims of the 1948 ethnic cleansing, as there was no grieving or compassion towards the victims uh, of Gaza in 2014. This guts mechanism appears as a strange sequence of counter arguments, beginning with total denial of the catastrophe, followed by a statement that if it did happen, the victims are responsible for their fate. And finally, anyway, they would say worse things happened elsewhere. For me, this is associated, this kind of mechanism of defense uh, is associated directly with two examples of structural dehumanization this conversation will be concerned with. The anti-Black racialized violence in the US, epitomized in the murder of George Floyd and others, and the dehumanization of the Palestinians over the years. In many ways, the interconnection between the racism in the US and in Israel has been recognized recently by the clear pro-Palestinian position of the Black Lives Matter movement and by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip who demonstrated in solidarity with the victims of the police violence in Ferguson. Struggling, struggling against both forms of dehumanization can may be defined as part of the new decolonization effort, one which will be effective only if it overcomes this dehumanization. How could we best challenge this dehumanization and lack of compassion, both in the case of the Jewish Zionist and Israeli attitude to the Palestinian uh, suffering through the ongoing catastrophe that is still, going, uh, is still uh, prevailing in Israel and Palestine on the one hand, and the long history and continued racialized dehumanization of the African Americans in the United States. Because if we will not, we will stick with the kind of political science, especially American political science assertion that conflicts or social tensions can only be managed and never be solved. So can we get out of this grievable, ungrievable uh, dichotomy in our daily activism towards groups of people whom we want to, to persuade to acknowledge the suffering of others as part of a, a real effort to bring peace and a, a solution to areas of violent uh, uh, clashes that still go on as, as we speak. Mm -hmm. um, well, thank you very much, Ilan, and, and thank, I, I want to thank everyone who made this event possible. I, I wish I could be there among you. I think uh, conversations happen differently in proximity with others and there's always this um, slight, slight or emphatic Zoom alienation that happens where I can't quite um, uh, be, be near you or um, express myself in, in, your, in your bodily proximity. I, I've come to um, recognize how much uh, is lost uh, when we're not in a room together. Um, at the same time, I'm very grateful for this, as it were, new interconnectedness that uh, obviously could have been available to us before, but we didn't, we didn't think imaginatively about how to connect people in different parts of the world. Um, so there's, there's some cause for affirmation, if not uh, celebration, that we're able to have this conversation. Um, Ilan, let me first say how much I have learned from you over the years. You were among the, the first historians um, um, uh, from within Israel who, um, who allowed me to reconstruct the, the history of the Nakba and to also to see how, um, how systemic the denial of that catastrophe is in the um, in the official and unofficial Israeli narratives of the founding of the State of Israel. So your, your historical work and your conceptual work have um, very clearly paved the way for many of us, uh, especially those of us who grew up within the matrix of Zionism for whom that was a, a worldview, a framework that was not exactly contestable um, 
as a young person. We didn't have a we didn't have an outside to that framework until um, the excellent work of uh, historians and political activists um, uh, started to open open that up. Um, but over time, it's also uh, been clear to me, as I'm sure it has been to you, that um, the internal critique of uh, of the Nakba and the systematic dispossession of Palestinians from their lands, um, uh, the dispossession, the, the incarceration, the, the killing, uh, the siege, um, um, the forced exile, um, all, all of this requires a different set of histories than the one that is simply the internal critique of Zionism that progressive or anti-Zionist Jews conduct. It's extremely important that we do so, except if we remain <laughs> caught in that framework, then we're just talking to ourselves. So part of me in listening to you, Ilan, thinks, well, yes, it's important to persuade um, uh, Zionists within Israel or Zionists within the diaspora to understand the radical uh, uh, oppression of Palestine that not only happened in 1948, but continues to happen, which is why the, the Nakba is, is indeed a continuing practice. It's not just 1948, it continues uh, in policy and practice, in occupation, in forced dispossession, in disenfranchisement, um, uh, in, in that area and, and beyond. And, and I think, um, that it has been important to leave that framework and to, in some ways, um, ask a different question, which is how to build international alliances um, that have as a, a primary um, a primary goal the, uh, the the liberation of Palestine, the enfranchisement of Palestinians, and to recognize. Um, the condition under which Palestinians live, not only as settler colonial, as you yourself has, have clearly pointed out and demonstrated, but also um, as, 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 as racism, as systemic racism. And, and as we do that, we link Palestine to other kinds of struggles, including um, uh, the anti-racism struggle in, in this country and throughout the world, but also um, abolition, prison abolition and carceral politics. And the reason I, I raise that is that um, if we think about the industries that have um, built the checkpoints and militarized police practices uh, throughout the Israeli regime, they are um, very often uh, the, the same corporations, the same practices that took place in Ferguson and take place um, in other kinds of police trainings uh, in Singapore, in South Africa in, in the United States. And so we have, a, we have a global condition, which is the militarization of the police. And we also have a framework understanding carceral politics as involving um, not just the abolition of prisons, but the prison system as it extends into everyday life through the, the militarization of the police. Um, so so that, that is already a framework that connects these struggles. Um, what you say about compassion is a very important, Ilan, and, and I don't mean to set it aside. I sometimes worry about compassion, um, that it involves uh, setting up a, an, an identification. Uh, these other people are just like me. So uh, just as I suffer, so others suffer. Just as my people suffer, so others suffer. And that is a principle of a quality and it's a it's an important one but there's also a different history you know so if I if I really want to um, be affected by uh, um, the the catastrophe of the Nakba on the ongoing catastrophe if I want to be affected by if I want to make myself open to the sufferings of others it may be that I I should not assume uh, an absolute uh, parallelism between um, the lives of others and my life. Because the tendency in the West is to say, 
oh, everyone is equal. Everyone is just like me. Everyone is a Western subject. <laughs> and so I assimilate it through my compassion, which is very commendable, right? Through my compassion, I assimilate everyone to me. <laughs> and it's like, no, that's, that's not going to work because there's a separate history there. And it's one we have to learn. It's also why um, we need to, to we, we need, many of us need uh, to learn other languages and other histories and other geographies so that we don't assimilate the sufferings of others to our own suffering. Because that, that just, you know, brings them into our model. Now, we might say that that's a, that's a, that's a risk we take within the humanist perspective, right? And as you say, rightly, how do we convince people, or persuade people, or get them to understand this, this uh, quite systematic dehumanization of Palestinians? That's a perfectly great question. The, 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 the problem that I see is that there's, a, there's an idea of the human that's lodged into the uh, critique of dehumanization. Uh, if, we, if, we, if, if, if Palestinians want to say, or, or non-Palestinians want to say, Palestinians are human just like everyone else, which version of the human are we invoking at that moment? You know? And so I, I think there are different modalities of, the, of, of, of human life. There are different human life worlds. There are many ways of enacting the human and of being within the zone of the human. Um, I worry sometimes that the human um, gets its distinctness through its separation from the animal, but why, why do we do that? And of course, we get very worried when people are through practices of racism, bestialized, you know, compared to animals or treated as animals. But that's also because animals are treated so badly and animals should not be treated so badly. And it would help us in our struggles to understand ourselves as human animals because human animals need food. They need provisions for food. They need provisions for shelter. They need provisions for health care. They are organic bodies that have basic requirements for life as, as Marx points out in the early manuscripts. So, you know, it may be that we need a, a new global understanding of the human animal to move forward. I, um, I do think there's a, a hardness, a refusal to accept Palestinian suffering as suffering on the part of those who want to give uh, the state of Israel the right to enact every and any aggression in the name of self-defense. Um, but cracking open that defensive, aggressive, murderous psychosocial position is an extremely difficult one. And my sense is that instead of like persuading one-on-one, -on -one, you know, which we've all done, yeah. uh, is to build the international alliance, to build a new consensus that Palestinian rights, Palestinian liberation must be part of any left liberation struggle. And that a leftism that's, that, that stops precisely at the moment of Palestine, I'm left on all these positions, but not Palestine. That is an inconsistent and contradictory leftism. So I think we need to overwhelm them and we need to surround them. We need to make this an unbeatable, <laughs> unovercomable consensus. And we do yeah. that through knowledge, through media, through politics. Yeah. Uh, we will, we might, we, if we have time, we have 45 minutes, go back to, to international solidarity, but uh, I fully agree with you. It just, uh, I still can't give up on hoping to have, to kind of penetrate through this wall of dehumanization and rejection, uh, but it is, uh, it is not the, the priority. I fully agree, and I, I agree with you that international networking in this in this respect is, is far more important. We need to prioritize also some of our efforts, I think. If I may move to, as I said, we'll move erratically from topic to topic, but I think they're all connected. And I do want to represent also uh, our community at large in what they would like to ask you. And we'll just scratch the surface uh, in 45 minutes where we are doing our best. So my second question is uh, concerns gender with specific interests stemming from our colleagues and students, and we have many of those, 
who work on gender, sexuality, and feminisms, in plural, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world. Uh, my entry point is a short quote from your work, and I'll quote, there is no gender uh, identity behind the expressions of gender. The ident that identity is performatively constituted by the very expressions that are said to be its results, expressions in inverted commas. There are probably two ways in approaching this question, a crude one and more, shall we say, uh, I don't know, scholarly one. The cruder approach would be, what is the relevance of a movement such as Me Too, born as a response to general abuse of women and developed into a more high profile exposure of certain misogynist and sexist work culture in the Western media and entertainment workplace to the struggle against a far, sometimes far harsher, and at time far more brutal repression in the rest of the world. Something was undoubtedly gained in the globalization of the movement, exposure, influence, and so on, but possibly other things were lost. For instance, an insistence on the centrality of race to the issue of gendered and sexualized violence. It feels like there are prospects for its influence if these axes of differences are re-engaged. Is this a case where universalism is actually Westernism? Or is it a case of an unrealized as yet universalism, as you put it, when you expanded in your writing and the meaning of universalism to include also what has not yet been realized as universal or is part of the promise of being universal, but is not being there yet? Put differently, what is your view on the scholarly and also activist schism, or maybe it's dispute, I don't know, maybe schism is too strong, that unravel between what my, we might call Western feminisms, on the one hand, and Arab, Muslim, or Islamic feminists, the ideas put forward by Amina Wadud, Layla Ahmad, and of course, Fatima Manisi, on the other. I don't mean a direct reference to the, the work, we don't have time to do that, but rather to the question, can there be a universal discussion on gender and sexuality that is blind to cultural context or cultural uh, relativism. Uh, as I said, many of our students are working on these issues and would love to hear your, your views about it. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think there can be, and there in fact is a global discussion on feminisms in the plural, um, but I'm not sure about universality. I, I think, uh, when we make universal claims, um, they always turn out to be parochial in some way. Um, and they, they are always contested by what they exclude or what they efface. And, um, and I think that that means that when we elaborate, we seek to elaborate a general claim, um, we have to do it through, um, through the practice of translation. Um, in other words, uh, um, it is only through uh, what, what I have called cultural translation, other people have called cultural translation, Said, Spivak and others, um, that we start to understand how, say, the structural um, um, oppression of women throughout the globe uh, takes place. There's no one model we can develop in one part of the world and impose upon the other. And of course, I, I have uh, um, emerged in the last um, 30 years uh, through, um, uh, through US feminism, which too often thought that feminist theory takes place in English. <laughs> that whatever is said in English is therefore universally true, right? So elaborating a kind of cultural imperialism at the level of language. But even the term gender is not easily translatable and many, um, many feminists have had to push back on the term gender or to find innovations within their own languages because it doesn't fit with the syntax of the language or perhaps it's not the central category for feminist concerns. Um, I think um, uh, that, well, uh, gender trouble from which you cite, I believe, uh, is now, I wrote it 33 years ago. I think it came out 31 years ago. Um, uh, it made general claims, but I don't think it sought to make universal claims. I think its concern was uh, precisely 
to see that the category of women was being assumed to have a kind of integrity or foundational status that um, uh, that didn't work, you know, that that produced a lot of contestation, and I think we see that that now as well as uh, trans women are struggling to be recognized as as women. I do, you know, is it possible to expand uh, the category to allow it a kind of historical elaboration or articulation so that it becomes more inclusive? Um, one of the, I mean, I wouldn't write gender trouble again, but one of the important perspectives that has emerged from um, decolonial feminism uh, is, is that colonial regimes instituted gender binaries um, as a Western imposition. Um, and, you know, at the time, 33 years ago, I just called it the heterosexual matrix. I don't think I would do that again. Um, but the question of how that gender binary got um, instituted by colonial regimes is an extremely interesting one. There are many scholars, feminist scholars in, in Uganda, for instance, who are, um, are able to track the, the British imposition of the gender binary. Uh, certainly we can track the French one too on its, on its uh, colonial um, uh, lands, its, its, its colonized uh, spaces. And, um, and so I think that actually a global feminism can take place, but not on the basis of assuming universality. I guess I'd like to say one, one further thing. Um, it worries me a lot that in places like France or in certain um, Anglo-American feminist uh, circles, um, claims are made about feminism that presume uh, that uh, Islamic feminism or feminism that emerges from North Africa or the Middle East um, uh, isn't real feminism because it, it doesn't have as its goal uh, a Western idea of emancipation. And, um, and I've been uh, appalled for, for now many years at how some uh, self-proclaimed feminists in France, for instance, assume that, um, that uh, all women who come from Arabic backgrounds or um, who come from Islamic backgrounds in particular are uh, subject to patriarchal control and that uh, nothing less than the destruction of the religion as a formative influence on women will liberate them. And this strikes me as an extraordinary form of Islamophobia that takes place under the name of feminism and that is actively promoted through uh, versions of uh, European white feminism. So that obviously has to be dismantled and there's now extraordinary uh, work that doesn't always get published or publicized in the American and uh, British and European Academy from scholars uh, like Leila Ahmed or Suad Joseph on the massive history and diversity of Islamic feminism and even the convocations of Islamic feminism, one of which took place in France a couple of years ago was barely mentioned by the, the French press as if it doesn't really exist, even though it had, I think, close to 3000 people attending. So, you know, there's a, there's a cultural war going on. And um, if feminism is to be uh, a, uh, a progressive and emancipatory movement, it has to be not only anti-racist, but it must include in its anti-racism an, an opposition to um, to Islamophobia, but also um, other forms of racism against um, against no North African and Middle Eastern um, um, peoples. That is, that makes the assumption that the Western ideal of feminism is the is the only possible emancipatory one. It's actually uh, a form of uh, cultural imperialism that traffics under the name of emancipation. So we all need, need to be involved in that criticism. If I can say one more thing, yeah. Ilana, I'm probably sure. taking up too sure. much time. No, 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 it's important. You know, I think I'm, I'm known for the so-called performativity of gender thesis and I will never live that down. It's only one part of my thinking and it, it's not one that I actually think about very much anymore 
in an active way. It's not the central aspect of my feminism. I, I draw from um, uh, a de decolonial feminist work in Latin America, Rita Segato. I, I draw from Ni Una Menos, the, uh, the wonderful movement um, uh, in, in Argentina that has uh, made waves throughout the world. Um, uh, I draw from the work of uh, Françoise Vergès or Gayatri Spivak and my, uh, my, my good friend Saba Mahmoud who, who died a few years ago, um, uh, Sara Ahmed. I, I draw from a, a wide range of work now and I'm, uh, I think it's extremely interesting to think about what it takes to have a global conversation that for me, uh, the work of translation, linguistic, and cultural is key there. That said, you know, uh, we're constantly learning, like, when, what it, you know, feminism has not just been about the equality of women, the emancipation of women from violence and subordination. It's also been a question, like, what is it to be a woman, or how is that category built, or regulated, or reproduced? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, 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 that, that means that the category is being rearticulated through time. So if I were to revise the performativity thesis, I would say um, that we are still in the process of rearticulating the category of women or men or other genders through different languages and different, different contexts. And that this uh, historical renewability of these categories is crucial to our political discourse and also um, part of the global challenge of feminism. If, if I may sort of, it, it might sound as if I'm sort of repeating the question or the argument, uh, but I do think that there is an, a new innuendo if we focus on the, the same question that we, we've just discussed on the situation of the LGBTQ communities in the Arab and, and the Muslim world. Uh, I think it's more intricate. It's more delicate, so to speak. Uh, I remember joining a demonstration in Greece against the oppression of the Catholic minority by the Orthodox Greek institution with a friend who was part of the movement for civil rights there. He told me that in the evening he's going to demonstrate against the Catholic Church for its treatment of the LGBT community in Greece. It is very difficult to indeed to navigate this particular matrix of politics of identity in the Arab and the Muslim world and remain a committed activist through performative action and resistance and not succumb, for instance, to a defeatist Foucaultian, Foucaultian view on the infinite power of uh, repression, which I think you among others successfully challenged. I think this challenge has never been more relevant when one discusses LGBTQ rights in the Arab and the Muslim world. There are those like Joseph Massad in his work, The Gay International, who argues that in the past, there were more discreet and pronounced ways of living LGBTQ lives that have now been substituted by more demonstrative ways of life and struggle imported from the West, which in turn produced existential dangers for the community that had not been there uh, before. Uh, I know this uh, uh, not just as an abstract uh, idea, I, I know that some of my gay friends in Palestine feel that way. My friend Usama Magdisi in a recent book, The Ecumenical Frame, that just came out, talks in general, not just about gender, but talks in general of an Arab world in which before it was invaded by imperialism, colonialism and Zionism, did not insist on articulating and stressing every difference and hence, sectar and hence sectarianism was not a destructive phenomenon, but rather a delicate and at times haphazard way of living. In a similar way, different gender identities were not insisted on, but existed. This is not entirely my position, I'm just representing that position. Do we have here again a Western point of view masquerading maybe as a universal one? and one which is devoid of historical and cultural context? Or do we need to be local at least, so to speak, on this issue and navigate between the principle and the local realities? We're thinking here about the work by Jason Ritchie, Lex Skin Splits, and Raul Raos Appeal in Queer Questions to employ what he called, and I think he called it heterotemporality, 
a situation, and I have a, a short quote, in which we could find a way to remain continuous with our past objection without being traumatized by it. This might keep us from descent into triumphalist futurity. And if I just may add to this something else, so I will end this uh, maybe intervention with a question that indicates that, and I think you, you alluded to it in, in your previous answer, that there's something positive in this delicate discussion is argued by uh, Wala al Kaisia in her work on the Palestinian group al Kaus for Sexual and Gender Diversity in Palestinian Society, that Wala argues is a productive side to think and practice decolonization since it does not allow separating the struggle for gender rights from decolonization. And thus enabled, for instance, a very uh, effective critique on Israel's uh, pinkwashing. Of course, it was not the only place where pinkwashing was, was criticized, but it was important to hear it from, from within. So can we be more sanguine and rather than aggravating the situation, we might even be able to use this particular topic to advance decolonization in Palestine and human rights elsewhere in the Arab world and beyond through the discussion, because uh, I'm talking to you from Haifa today, unfortunately I'm not in Exeter. And this is a topic which is very difficult to, to uh, engage with, uh, but I think that, that we need to continue engaging with it, of course, and find maybe even better ways to bring it to the fore as part of a general discussion of human rights and decolonization. Um. Well, first of all, um, I think uh, that um, I used to meet uh, with uh, al Kaos when, when I went to Palestine. I don't think I'm allowed through that border anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but my understanding in, in their writings and, um, uh, you know, especially Hanin Makai and others that um, uh, that the effort to the struggle for LGBTQ rights, uh, and we can talk about rights uh, afterwards, uh, has to be linked with the critique of Zionism and, in particular, the critique of settler colonialism as it has taken form and perpetuated itself in Palestine. And, and that's, that seems very clear. It seems um, uh, very important. And one reason it's important is that it's not just a question of identity, like gay, lesbian, trans, bisexual identity and getting recognition for identity. This is my identity. I want to be recognized. I don't want to be oppressed on the basis of my identity. These are also communities. These are networks. These are forms of life. Um, and they're forms of life, they're communities that are figuring out how to live, how to support one another, and also to be part of a larger struggle that opposes racism, settler colonialism, um, uh, the state violence, um, uh, and, and homophobia and transphobia, of course, and misogyny, and a whole list of interlocking oppressions. But, but the, the, on the one hand, yes, we want globalism because we want to understand the very specific struggles that are taking place. And, you know, Massad did make an important point, which is that hypervisibility is not always the, the main aim of LGBTQ movements outside of the urban centers of Europe and the United States. The, the point is not to get more visibility as if visibility itself were good. Visibility also makes one a target. Visibility without a sustaining community and a and a um, and a neutralization of police violence or of social violence, you know, visible visibilization is it does not does not achieve the goal. What one wants is visibility within a framework that is actually transforming society more broadly, not just on the issue of LGBTQI rights and um, emancipation, but on all of the interlocking issues. So we have to have an interlocking framework within a specific region. At the same time, we need to be trans-regional in our thinking, right? I mean, right now, 
what, what do we make of the fact that uh, trans people are being denied their rights in places like Poland and Romania and that, um, uh, and, and in Hungary and, and that, um, that gender is being you know, taken out of the school curriculum in France and how does this relate to what's happening um, in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, in Palestine? Uh, what are the links? What are the incommensurabilities? So I, I, I sometimes think that if we are just regional in our analysis, we miss the, the trans-regional ties. We, we miss the, um, the, the, the larger question of how the family and its heteronormative framework is being solidified under conditions of militarization, but also neoliberalism, also uh, certain in, within certain religious frameworks. Um, what is the relationship between the heteronormative family and the state? And how do we have a trans-regional analysis of that? Um, of course, we need regional specificity, but we also need the trans-regional ties, not just to have a better uh, trans-regional analysis, but also to find the sites of alliance and solidarity that exist there. Mm -hmm. Judith, we have time for only one question. And as I say, we just scratched the surface, but I already see in the chat fantastic questions, so I'm not worried. Of course, we will not cover everything. Uh, we, we need to finish, and, I, and we can't sort of ignore uh, the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> even even if we want to. So I, I will finish with the question of, of COVID-19 and its impact. And again, I, 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 I apologize for jumping from topics to topics, but as I said, they're all connected. In a recent talk you gave, you analyzed the way both optimistic and pessimistic leftist notions generated by COVID-19 were somewhat misguided. My, my words, you didn't use the word misguided, but that's what I, I understood. As an activist, I fully understand the wish to arrive already now at some assertive conclusions about the impact of the pandemic or, or the impact the pandemic has had on our lives. However, as an historian, I'm quite bewildered at this attempt to summarize an event that still goes on without any benefit of hindsight. As historians, we are still grasping desperately for comprehending fully events such as the Arab Spring and even so many years later, even the Iranian Revolution. But nonetheless, there is nothing wrong with some interim summation. You commented, and this was, I found it very powerful, that it seems that the neoliberal world was very quick to impose on the new reality, its morality and codex by talking about the health of the economy rather than about the health of the people. In particular, ignore the health of those in the neoliberal capitalist world had already been the collateral damage of a healthy economy even before the pandemic. The proportional number of fatalities in minority communities in the UK, in the US, and places such as Brazil attest to it. So in this respect, my worry is that very much as in the case of Occupy Wall Street, and for that matter, the Arab Spring, the commitment to resist social, economic, and political injustices is an energetic reaction against the apparent neoliberal abuse of the pandemic, but one that yet again is not translated into a sustained social movement of change. Are we putting aside once more, as in 2008 and in the Arab world in 2012, the necessity to organize, to coordinate a great and international counter-alliance to the one that degrades human life and well-being, especially under the panic of the pandemic? Can the more traditional left still contribute in this respect by offering unions and even parties? Or are you content with more anarchic and sporadic shows of anger and protest? that after all do change the media discourse and maybe have an impact of its uh, uh, agenda. And since this is the last question, I suppose this is also true to the solidarity movement with Palestine and in a way goes back to your first answer about the international uh, networking, uh, whether it is uh, uh, against this kind of what uh, Chomsky now called the, the biofeudalism of pharmacist, pharmacist to pharmaceutical uh, giants who use the, the pandemic or the old oppression of corporations. So we'll finish with that question and then we'll open up uh, to the rest of the audience. Okay. Um, well, I think um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, there were some people, Arundhati Roy, 
who talked about the pandemic as a possible portal onto a different future. And I think uh, my colleague Angela Davis also thought maybe bringing the economy to a halt would allow for us to take a kind of collective historical moment to reflect on what ought the economy to look like. Let's not rebuild in the same way. And of course, I also have that hope, um, no way not to have that hope. Uh, um, at the same time, there were, and from the very beginning, uh, those who said this is going to bolster the power of pharmaceuticals. This is going to bolster uh, state monitoring um, um, and, uh, and surveillance um, powers more generally, and that it will exacerbate uh, geopolitical inequalities and, and, um, and racial inequality within both local, within local, regional, and global um, spheres. And um, I think that we have no doubt seen the intensification of uh, radical inequality. And we see that um, through the, uh, the ways in which the vaccine has been distributed, the ways in which vaccines are affordable, um, and uh, who, you know, which countries have them and are rapidly uh, vaccinating everyone and, and which do not. I think the f Israel has, as I think, unjustly received praise for, um, uh, for vaccinating those who live within 48, but even within 48, I'd like to know how many of those are Jewish and how many of those are not Jewish. And, and the lack of access to vaccines within Palestine is abominable and not properly uh, covered by the media, even the left media. Um, so, uh, you know, we do see these intensification of racial and uh, social class inequalities. There's no question about it. But the fact that we see them, the fact that they're more, that they're brought into relief can also be a cause for some optimism because uh, it's, it's rather hard to deny. Um, um, uh, those, those inequalities are made much more explicit and so become available to a certain kind of tracking historically, politically, culturally. Um, I, I don't think the pessimists or the optimists are misguided. I think there is no way not to feel both. In other words, I feel both. I think many people oscillate between optimism and pessimism. I think climate change has received a kind of new attention in part because we understand the interconnected world a bit better by virtue of the pandemic. Um, you know, the pandemic is a, is a disease of the interconnected world. So once we get the interconnected world, what does that say about labor? What does it say about resources? What does it say about uh, global inequalities and corporate power and its, and its, and its effect? What does it say about uh, de decolonial structures? Um, it gives us another framework outside of nationalism and individualism. Um, and I can only hope that both of those ideologies are more firmly um, uh, displaced uh, uh, in, in, the, in the course of our, our thinking and reacting to the pandemic. Uh, you know, there's, there's much more to say on this topic. Uh, um, and I've been, I've been trying to put my, my thoughts together about it, but maybe it's best to open to questions and I can circle back if that seems appropriate. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, it was good to end it. Optimistic, uh, as we used to say, partly pessimist and optimist. Famous novel by Emil Habibi, which I think is kind of a, a permanent situation, uh, condition of Palestinians to be both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time, which gives you power uh, to continue. Katie, I'm, I'm moving back to you. Uh, uh, we are ready to to handle the questions and comments uh, from the audience. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you both. Um, you've given us so much to think about and so much to do. Uh, there are questions coming in. And again, we're really happy to invite these on in the chat and um, the Zoom, the, in the Zoom chat, and then also using the hashtag uh, ButlerPay2021. But we are going to start with a question that's come in on the Zoom chat from Constantine. 
um, who says, we touched on the Me Too movement earlier, and I wondered if we could bring in another very topical mov movement, Black Lives Matter. Violence as an organizing force is part of Professor but Butler's oeuvre of work. I'd be interested to hear their commentary. And I think I'm going to abuse my position as chair, as they say, um, to invite you as well to reflect on your latest work, um, The Force of Nonviolence. And, and I thought you just did such a wonderful job of revisiting some of the work in gender trouble. I wondered if perhaps speaking through the lens of the new work as well in, in your, your response to this question would be really enlightening for us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, well, there are several things to say. Black Lives Matter has been just um, an enormously powerful movement, one of the most powerful anti-racist movements um, that I've seen in the United States. And, and it obviously has had reverberations throughout the world with um, BLM events in, in, various, uh, in, in various parts of the world. Um, but maybe let's distinguish between Black Lives Matter as a political organization, which now has its own structure and the movement for Black Lives, which is a broader category and includes all kinds of um, uh, structured and spontaneous social movements that are combating racism that may not be part of that particular political organization. Um, the, uh, uh, I think Black Lives Matter is, um, it is a, a nonviolent movement. Uh, there have been, you know, some violent scuffles around the, the edges of it, but I believe it is not only a nonviolent movement, but it's a movement that is anti-violence. It's and and um, the violence that it opposes um, is of course racist violence, but it's also institutional and systemic, which means that it um, identifies the entire carceral. Uh, apparatus of capitalism, that which Angela Davis has brought out so importantly, Angela and, and, and Gina Dent and, and so many, so many others. So um, it, it's it's allowed us to shift the question uh, uh, to a systemic level. At the same time, to see that what has what happened to um, Breonna Taylor um, or George Floyd or Eric Garner is also happening at systemic levels through the prison system and through policing practices. I mean, just a few miles from here, uh, I believe yesterday or the day before, a man was uh, pinned down, sitting on a park bench, drinking, pinned down on his stomach and killed within five minutes through a manu police maneuver, which was very similar to the George Floyd maneuver. And we'll, we'll see whether that gets the same press. This, these are not only repeated practices, but they're sanctioned. And the police who do them are understand themselves as exonerated in advance. In other words, they kind of know it's criminal, but they also know they'll be exonerated because they are immune from that. So the George Floyd uh, verdict has been enormously important in, um, uh, in sending the message that that form of exoneration in advance is no longer available to you. It is. It, it will take enormous struggle to make that clear. And I can't help but note that in the U.S. right now, there are some police actions that are taking revenge on the on the on the conviction of Derek Chauvin by repeating the act. And I fear that that has happened just a few miles from here. I'll check later to see if there's a demonstration I'm supposed to be at later today. <laughs> Probably yes. Uh, um, I, um, you know, Me Too is a really important movement, um, but it's tricky because it tends to be individual is individualistic, my story, my story, my story, where it gets enormously powerful is when we see that the stories are similar and we see the institutions, whether they're educational institutions, corporations, entertainment industries, um, governments that 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 uh, protect harassers or who who reproduce harassment as a way of life, um, actually give, giving it a kind of permission to continue, uh, and not just harassment, but also uh, rape or violence against women more broadly. So I I get somewhat frustrated with me too because of its individualism, but I believe in the importance of understanding the, the systemic and sometimes the individual story is what 
opens us to an understanding of the systemic. And when that happens, it's, I think, most, most powerful. I'm not sure I answered the question, but that's the train of thought to which your question <laughs> led. So it's going to have to suffice. <laughs> um, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we have, we ready for the next question. Yeah, perfect. Um, so we have a question from Neha um, from Twitter. Um, Ari, the potential internet, international solidarity alliance, how can we approach the way a modern university is discordant, simultaneously advocating for progress and solidarity whilst investing in the military industrial complex? Only as individuals, or is there a need for the academic institution to look at itself as a hypo hypocritical space? Hmm. Well, um, maybe um, let me say that individual action is, is all very, um, noble and good, but uh, collective action is much more powerful and collective action that targets institutional structures uh, and their implication in uh, economies of violence is, is even more powerful. So um, I, in the most recent work, The Force of Nonviolence, I do criticize the ideology of individualism and suggest that we, um, we think of um, a politics of nonviolence, which is also a politics of anti-violence as a collective structure that focuses on systemic violence and also the strategies by which violent regimes reproduce themselves by calling their violence something else like self-defense. Um, and I think we obviously see that in the case of the state of Israel, but we also see it um, in police action and militarized police action throughout the world. Um, I also think neoliberal economic policies, which abandon people and destroy, uh, abandon people to illness and to death or to unlivable work conditions, they, that's not always called violence, but that form of systematic negligence that puts whole populations at risk of uh, illness or death and we see this in the pandemic, we see it in Brazil, that's also a kind of violence. So, you know, we do need to think, I believe that way. And maybe to go back to Elon, um, I mean, I think there are good reasons to consider anarchy and what it has to tell us about contesting rules of law that are unjust, but sporadic anarchic uh, actions is, is, is not the same as a uh, a strong international coalition. I'm not sure the old left, as it were, is going to be our best ally here, uh, precisely because of the way in which questions of sexuality, gender, race, uh, uh, col coloniality, uh, broadly understood, got sidelined. So, you know, we also need to renew a certain kind of old left, which is, I think, too often uh, based on a on, a, on an idea of class that is not fundamentally intersectional. Um, so, um, you know, I, 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 I don't accept like it's, anar you know, sporadic anarchism and then the old left. I actually think there are new forms of internationalism that might be better understood as, as trans-regional. I guess the trans-regional is the lens through which I'm trying to think global solidarity. Uh, and I see it in some of the feminist movements that are really pushing the left in throughout Latin America. It's enormously important. Um, in any case, I, I don't know, again, if that answered the question, but that was the, um, the train of thought. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll chip in uh, uh, just to this one. Um, I would like to, to tackle it from a different angle, which I hope complements uh, Judith's uh, 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 reply. Uh, and I was thinking about this question, not necessarily only about working in a university that encourages military uh, investment or uh, develops, helps to develop uh, lethal weapons or securitization means that uh, oppresses society. I was thinking about it when I thought originally that I could be part of the academic community in Israel and call for the academic boycott on Israel. And I remember when I was castigated for this, I said to uh, my colleagues and to, especially to the university management who found it totally 
unacceptable that someone who is a member of the faculty would uh, uh, justify uh, institutional boycott on Israeli universities for their complicity in the oppression of the Palestinians. And I said, well, I'm, I'm not sure that a, a public uh, university is that different from a country. In the sense that I'm a member of that community, I pay the taxes, not in the same way that you pay taxes to, to a government, but I'm a member of the community uh, and I'm entitled to uh, criticize and even call for pressure on my government, so to speak, in this respect, the institution, uh, be, be, if it pursues immoral policies to, to my mind. Uh, in fact, uh, if I stick to the original ethos of a university, which comes from the word universal ideas and so on, uh, I, I should, I'm actually obliged to do it. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm realistic. I, I understand that this is not always that easy. It depends on your position in the university. It depends on which country uh, uh, you live. So each one of us has to navigate between a very strong moral conviction, I think, as either junior or senior member of faculty or, or a postgraduate student for that matter, and review what the specific institution in which we work does as part of its institutional policy. There are various means in which you can engage uh, uh, with that policy. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to promise here an easy ride. Uh, institutions don't like it. They see it as a betrayal. Uh, they see it as uh, an act of uh, uh, and, and uh, that this is not a collegial uh, act uh, among the the, uh, the faculty, uh, but this is a constant. This is a constant struggle um, uh, that some of us uh, have been been at it for 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 decades now. Uh, so I would encourage uh, who, who, wherever you are who, who ask the question on Twitter to to be as much as loyal as you can to your basic principles, and if they clash with what your university is doing as an institution or your state is doing as an institution uh, to act in a way that you are thinking uh, or you deem right. And I, I totally agree with, with Judith. I think one of the things I felt in high and I didn't feel it later, was loneliness. I didn't have a reference group. Palestinians had a reference group in Israel. I didn't have a reference group. I was part of the six people who signed as Israeli academics the uh, call for the academic institution in the world to boycott Israel. There were not even six. We were worried that uh, the four people who really were alive, we added two people who were already dead because we were worried that four people would look pathetic. So we added two names of people who were not alive anymore to say that there are six Israeli academics <laughs> who, 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 who called boycott me. Uh, anyway, so, so yes, this is a crucial question. And I think that... Um, there's not easy answer, but I do agree. I, I, I found it myself. I'm not talking now abstractly or philosophically. I'm talking practically. Being part of an international network, network on these issues empowers you, enhances you, enables you to withstand even an institutional wrath. I'm not saying that every time it succeeds. Some of our colleagues lost their jobs. I'm not, talking, not just about Israel. I mean, when they had these kinds of position, but I think it's part of our duty. Thank you, Ilan. Um, well, let me go back for a moment um, uh, to the question of the university. I want to respond better to that last question and then address Ilan on the question of boycott. Um, first of all, I mean, there is now an extraordinary problem, we might say, in what we could call the neoliberal university. And, and this is extremely important for those of you who are also thinking about um, decolonization and what that means. Um, many universities will offer black studies or they'll offer uh, courses on um, decolonial thought. Um, and, and, the, and that will become part of their liberal arts or, or curriculum, right? They, they offer this, you can come, you can study. And yet at the same time, the institution is involved in um, uh, excluding uh, informally or formally uh, black and brown students because it's unaffordable or because it markets its way, in, it markets itself in a certain way, or it may well be involved in 
reproducing a colonial curriculum in the rest of what it's doing um, in an effort to achieve neoliberal uh, points, ranking, uh, revenue, uh, 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 global recognition, all, all of that. Um, so we have to be careful because um, uh, it's very possible that a colonizing institution offers a course in decolonial thought as a way of deflecting from its ongoing operations, its investments, right? Its, um, its, its priorities, um, its um, decimation of the arts and humanities and critical thought, its, um, its uh, efforts to produce um, uh, a majority white student body, right? So we, we actually have to see both what the institution is offering uh, and look at those offerings a little bit like the way we look at pink washing, right? It's like, oh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, colonial powers or um, uh, neoliberal powers or or racist powers seeking to cloak their ongoing uh, uh, complicity in oppressive structures by offering courses in anti-oppression. So. We can't just have the narrow cultural analysis. We can't just be happy for the class, although we are happy for the class, don't get me wrong. But from the class, we need the critique of the institution. Now, I think that higher education um, in general has to become massively porous. It needs to, um, the, the walls that, that separate the university from the communities that it ought to be serving, uh, those have to become thinner. They have to be more porous. It has to be easier to enter. And those that pertains to questions of accessibility and affordability. So race and class and gender, right? All of that. Um, so, you know, that's a larger discussion, but I, I, I did have seen, um, uh, you know, struggles uh, in, in South Africa, for instance, um, where uh, the curriculum has for too long been imported from colonial um, uh, models. Uh, and some of the tactics have been, to, okay, you can have this one. I mean, it was a struggle even in Johannesburg to establish black studies as a field. <laughs> but once it's there, what, what does it do to make us rethink the curriculum and the institution of the university? All these are crucial and that struggle is also happening in India right now. It's, it's um, where the decolonization efforts are, are massive um, and, and, and punished um, for, for their, um, their efforts to rethink the curriculum and to establish the university as a space of assembly and free expression. Not so easy right now. Um, that said, um, BDS, I mean, I think um, Israeli institutions or um, individuals within Israeli institutions who call for boycott against uh, uh, Israeli institutions funded by the state um, are in fact acting in a very just way. There's no question about it. It's, of course, you are subject to uh, losing your job. Uh, Ariella Azulai was basically blacklisted for her uh, courageous position. Luckily, she now has quite a public platform from Brown University. I'm really glad about that. But we know other people who have not survived. And we also know this massive expat community, some of you I'm recognizing on the screen, <laughs> who are no longer able to, um, to, to live and work there. Uh, so so it's, a, it's an enormously important um, uh, principle. BDS is a nonviolent movement, but um, and it's the largest nonviolent uh, movement for Palestinian emancipation in the world. Um, it only continues to gather more strength and as it, can, as it gathers strength, it is more severely maligned and misrepresented as terrorist or as violent or as anti-Semitic. And you know, it's exhausting to rebut those um, false allegations, and they have to be uh, rejected and demonstrated to be false. But we also need to expose the strategies of that particular industry that continues to malign not just BDS supporters, 
uh, within 48 or outside as anti-Semitic or aligned with terrorists. Um, but that discredit, discredits Palestinian emancipation and liberation, the right to return, uh, the right to, to equality, the, the right to political self-determination, uh, the right not to live under siege, the, the right not to live subject to uh, uh, militarized violence. So um, it's very important that these be linked and that we remember that the Palestinian struggle is the primary struggle. Those of us who are, you know, Ashkenazi Jews or even, you know, I'm not Israeli, I don't even have relatives that I know about in Israel, but, you know, yeah, we suffer, but we don't suffer anywhere near what Palestinians have suffered. So our suffering needs to be linked to theirs. And that's the most important thing. It's, it's hard when you're called an anti-Semite, it's like, oh, I need to defend myself. It's like, mm, don't take the bait. They're, what they're do this, is, this strategy is not just used against you, it's used against all people. And it's used against Palestinian emancipation, basic human rights, basic access to democratic self-rule, right? Uh, basic rights of political self-determination. So um, if, one's, if one gets caught in one's own kind of pain, like, oh no, I've been called this and that, then you've lost your connection. So recognize the strategy for what it is and turn the, turn the light on them. <laughs> like this is their strategy and this is the effect it has on Palestine, right? So starting maybe from one's own place outside, but make sure it leads back there because that is our priority. Thank you. Uh, we have one final question from Avira. Um, it's a question for Professor Butler uh, on the conversation regarding Joseph Massad's work. While he makes important interventions regarding incitement to discourse and the universalization of sexual epistemologies, he seems to foreclose any emancipatory possibilities of, say, queer Palestinian organizing, even in its explicitly anti colonial iterations. Could you speak to one, the longevity of the tension that the identity politics continue to pose to seemingly all encompassing anti-colonial politics, especially the accusation of imperial collusion that Massad sometimes fixates on, to the possibility of non-cest, non-heterosexual politics in the non-West that can refuse, subvert, avoid imperial collusion, so to speak. Um. Well, there are different, different questions in that question. First, let me say um, that my understanding of what worries Mossad is uh, human rights, the human rights paradigm. And um, one concern he has is that the human rights paradigm is Western and culturally imperialist, but also that the human rights paradigm when taken as a self-sufficient paradigm deflects from settler colonialism. And it matters whether you are uh, making a list of human rights violations in say in Palestine um, committed by Israeli forces like, you know, and it's important to have a list, right? We need the list. We need to know exactly what happened and to have the archive as it were. It's one thing to have a list. It's another thing to frame that list within the ongoing operation of settler colonialism in Palestine. It's another thing to ask how that form of settler colonialism relates to other forms throughout the world and how we come up with a larger uh, comparative per perspective on, on settler colonial practices, especially um, of, of violence and dispossession and appropriation, land appropriation. So, um, you know, I think that uh, Mossad takes a very strong uh, view on human rights, which is negative. Um, and I'm more ambivalent. I, I think I see a place for human rights frameworks. I also don't think they are sufficient. We can't stay totally within them because the problem is not just human rights violation, although I do think we can make better use of the crimes against humanities rubric uh, as, as is being done to expose US racism right now uh, by an, an important commission. Um, uh, I think we need to understand the 
economic and political formation of settler colonialism in Palestine and then put the human rights framework within that. So that's my, that's my view on that. I, here's another view though. Um, LGBTQ is not identity politics. And I always worry when people just assume that, oh, this is about identity, 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 identity. It's one of Massad's point, and he's queer, right? He's a queer theorist, uh, critical of queer theorists, but he is, he is a queer theorist. And queerness is not so much, at least in its origin, an identity than it is a, a form of alliance and a way of thinking um, uh, a, apart from the straight line and, um, and, and, and trying to develop coalitional uh, structures that, are, that actually decenter identity. So um, I always get worried that, oh, LGBTQ is identity politics, it's cultural, it's linked to recognition of identity. And then there's broader politics, economics and, and geopolitical, this, no, 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 no. <laughs> This, this cannot be the case. This cannot be the case. Um, uh, because I mean, and I've always thought it was a little funny, the LGBTQI plus A, you know, oh, did I forget A? You know, I mean, it, it it's a list, right? It's, a, it's an expanding list, but it doesn't really say what's the interconnection between those consonants? Uh, <laughs> what, what links them? What, and, and to what are they linked? outside of the list. Um, my sense is that the struggle for LGBTQIA plus rights is a struggle for justice, for equality, for freedom, it, which means that any struggle for justice, for equality, and for freedom is not complete, is not honest, is not comprehensive, unless it includes the specific struggles for LGBTQIA plus struggles. If, if that gets reduced to identity politics, then acknowledgement takes care of it, right? Cultural recognition, oh, let's have a parade. That's, that's where pinkwashing comes in. Oh, let's, let's honor, you know, the Hollywood stars who are, queer, you know, whatever. This is not the same as understanding what it is to live persecuted, you know, marginalized, pathologized, subject to psychiatric detention, subject to losing your uh, your citizenship, uh, uh, what these forms of persecution are, and what the norms of emancipation might be that emerge from those movements, which are linked to the feminist movement, right? The violence against women, is, it's linked to violence against queer people, non-gender conforming people, trans people. It's got to be linked. If it's not linked, what's it doing? And if it doesn't have race as the as a central component of what's going on, then it's missing whole dimensions of what's going what's going on in the world. So, I am I I, I am with Massad in claiming that LGBTQIA plus is not identity politics. The biggest single example of identity politics that we have in this world is white supremacy. That is identity politics. That's a group that it will do anything and will destroy anything in the name of protecting, promoting the supremacy of whiteness. That's identity politics. I think we need to turn this table. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of this one, I gotta say. Uh, yes, I think I, I, I agree, but maybe also settler communities which are still intact are also identity uh, groups. Uh, but, and definitely, and I think that's the main thing, isn't it? Uh, uh, or difference uh, between an academic comparison of so-called politics of identity and the activist drive for politics of identification rather than politics of identity. And I think if you are involved in policies of identification, it is not so much uh, the identity, uh, whether the individual or collective identity, uh, of the people who you think are your potential allies in such a coalition, but rather whether they are also oppressed. And is there a connection between their uh, oppression to, to your oppression, to, to your victimization? 
and, and the more we, we study the world uh, as political economists, as philosophers, as historians, we see these connections, these webs. They're rarely discrete cases of oppression that are not connected to cooperation, to global realities, uh, and so on. So, so I really think this is something to, to, to work on. And, and, and some of our friends are trying to work on it. And I think when we put the politics of identification at the center, we might even find uh, relevant uh, definitions for decolonization in the 21st century, which sounded like a bit of paradoxical idea in, in this century but in many ways connects not just different parts of the world and different oppressed groups, but connects our recent past with the present, showing us that we're in the same historical chapter still in the history of this globe. Uh, and we didn't have yet a closure uh, for that kind of, of policies. Uh, I don't know, Katie, if we have more time or we should release uh, uh, Patel, who is very kind <laughs> and generous with her time. Yeah, uh, and, and, and thoughts. If I may, uh, briefly, thank you, Ilan and Katie and everyone. Um, Ilan, you know, I also, um, you know, I, I, I've always um, loved the work of Stuart Hall and he gives us a way of thinking about identification rather than identity, which I, I very much appreciate. But I would just say this, that in our solidarities, um, there are struggles, there are aggressions, there are conflicts, and it's not always a question of identification. It's also a question of alliance where we acknowledge differences that are in some cases insuperable, but we work together anyway because our larger aims are, um, are so consonant and so resonant with one another that it's imperative. So solidarities have, have antagonism in them. They have conflicts. They also have difference. And I worry that identification sometimes covers that over. Um, and I, I, um, uh, I, th I think we, we need to learn to, 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 build, um, to build large networks that ag acknowledge the, the conflicts that are yet to be worked out and maybe will never be worked out. We don't always have to love each other or be um, fully identified with one another to move forward as a, as a strong coalition. Yes, dialogue is a way of life, not as a, as a means of sol solving a problem. This is definitely something. Katie, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both um, for <laughs> such a generous and deeply inspiring and thoughtful conversation. We could listen to you for hours, literally. Um, I'd like to invite everyone who's here with us on Zoom to turn your cameras on, um, to, to wave, to say hello, to say thank you to our incredible guests. Um, and again, to thank everyone for being with us from across the globe um, this evening, this morning for you, Professor Butler. Um, and, and yeah, to, yeah, to go forward. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie and everyone. Thank you. <laughs>